All right. So my name is Neil Ajantwood Murthy, and today I will be talking about the Indian flapshell turtle, as well as my encounters with the Indian flapshell turtle. First off, I first need to talk about what is a turtle for people who have a small understanding of these creatures. Turtles are an order of reptiles classified as test students. They're commonly known for their features. Their most commonly known feature is their shell. The shell is divided into two parts, the carapace and the plastron. So the carapace is generally situated on the back of the turtle's shell, as well while the, the plastron is situated on the underbelly and chest. These are covered in hard scoots, which are like snake scales because they're shed as the turtles grow larger. So some studies have shown that turtle shells are essentially evolved ribs. Now we're going to get to what a soft shell turtle is. Soft shell turtles are a specific genus of turtles, family of turtles, which do not possess scoots on their shell, which makes it soft and fleshy. They developed this so that they could squeeze into tight spaces. They also have a proboscis and extremely long necks, which are extendable. Their feet are webbed and three clawed, hence the name for their family, Tyonychidae, which means three clawed. Mm. So now we're going to get to the specific species, which is the Indian flapshell turtle. Indian flapshell turtles are a species of soft shell turtles, scientifically called Lysimus punctata. They are called so because they have flaps on their plastron, which cover their legs to prevent dehydration when they attract into the shell. It is the smallest of all soft shell turtles in India. The Indian flap shell turtle is generally omnivorous. It eats almost everything in the aquatic in in the aquatic environment, such as tadpoles, frogs, fish, crustaceans, snails, earthworms, insects, carrion, and water plants. There, the southern subspecies we found on campus was uh, where lay this, this species subspecies lays 25 to 33 millimeter long eggs in a, in clutches of two to eight eggs. So the swampy areas with soil and lots of exposure to sunlight are very good nesting sites for these creatures. They're buried under, under the soil for protection. The eggs are spherical in shape, like with most turtles' eggs. The nesting period usually begins around June to November. When they hatch, they are 4.2 centimeters long. Now, you, normally in any species, you'd expect female and males to be longer than females. But in this case, the Indian flapshell turtle, females which grow up to 37 centimeters are larger than males. So we found two Indian flapshell turtles on campus. So one was a, this one was a female and this one was a male, right? So the female was a lot larger than the male. Yeah, so just basically this is a comparison. <laughs> The Indian flapshell turtle, well, at least the ones we find on campus, will be a, a brownish-green hue, while some other subspecies, maybe in the north, you'll find them with yellow spots on their carapace. They're also cream-colored. It has seven callosities or markings on the plastron. Like most turtles, when they're in water, they stretch, they stretch their necks ridiculously long so they can breathe from say the bottom of a small pond. This also makes them rather dangerous if they're provoked because they have sheer like teeth. I've actually heard reports from somewhere in Bangladesh where people have had their fingers bitten off by soft shell turtles, but don't worry, not flap shell turtles. Also, they have three claws on their limbs like most soft shell turtles. So in 2020, in Balasore, Odisha, there was a fully yellow flapshell turtle found, an albino. I actually got an, this article was actually sent to me, by, to me by, by my mother. And it was a very interesting topic to pick up. 
you know, it's a yellow flap shell turtle. See, something in. Here we're going to get to some of the pictures of these creatures. Here we have the albino flap shell turtle. Here we have the, uh, one of the flap shell turtles we found slightly stretching their neck. This is only slightly stretching the neck. They can stretch it a lot longer. We just couldn't find any photos of them fully stretching their neck. And here we have a demonstration of the plastin. This is an Indian flap shell turtle's plastin with the flaps and the callosities. And they can also fully retract into the shell, which I forgot to mention a bit earlier. It's okay. It'll be mentioned later. So here we have an Indian flap shell turtle that is partially inside its shell. And when they fully retract into their shell, they generally do that as a source of protection, like most turtles. Now it's lifespan. I couldn't find out much about the Indian flap shell turtle's lifespan. All I could find is that it lives 17.8 years in captivity. I'm not going to do the math on that one. The Indian flap shell predators include large fish, marsh crocodiles, wild boar, ri river otters, and even other soft shell turtles. Their biggest predators are humans, obviously, but when in danger, they secrete an egg yolk like fluid with a bad odor to scare away predators. I learned this from experience, sadly. The Indian flap shell turtle is found nearly all over the Indian subcontinent. It's found in Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, as well as the Indus and Ganges drainages and Myanmar. It's only been introduced to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. It's found in the desert ponds of Rajasthan, where hundreds die every year during the dry summers. You see, they live in the desert ponds. The desert ponds are evaporated. So where are they going to live? They're aquatic creatures. Luckily for the turtle, it's well suited to, to drought conditions, but can't survive for that long. Maybe 160 days, but not that, not that much longer. Some have seen, so people have seen them live up to 160 days in a state of estivation. This is an op the opposite of hibernation. In hibernation, you would sleep a long time in the winter, while some creatures, like the Indian flap shell turtle, use it in summer. The turtle mainly burrows and moves from waterhole to waterhole to avoid desiccation. And they can also fully retract into the shell. The Indian flap shell turtle is found in salt marshes, canals, and cities, rivers, ponds, oxbow lakes, streams, and rice fields. It also lives in irrigation tanks. The place where we found the Indian flap shell turtles on campus was the Black Lagoon, AKA a well that lives in the campus. So they were found after the well was emptied. So it's suspected that they were all in that well. I need to take a better look on that one. Waters with sand or mud bottoms are preferred because of the turtle's tendency to burrow. They're very strong burrowers, see? I've seen them burrow you know, very, very, very quickly. So here we have a picture of some 650 Indian flap shell turtles that were found in a smuggler's hideout. So its IUCN status is vulnerable due to poaching, but that's not the only threat. The shell is believed to have many medicinal uses and is ground into powder to make traditional medicines but there's no scientific proof of such. There's not no scientific proof that backs this. It's basically, you no, know, tribal superstition. Not tribal superstition, superstition. In many South Asian provinces, flap shell turtles and their eggs are eaten as a rich source of protein. Due to conservation efforts, the value of the meat increased on an illegal scale. So because less turtles were being killed, the value of the meat increased which led to more people wanting to kill them, which led to an increase in the killing and exploitation of these creatures. They also suffer from habitat loss, major changes to the, national, to the natural habitat, such as the construction of dams and barrages, as well as cultivation along riverbanks and pollution. They live in aquatic environments. 
we can't lose the Indian flapshell turtle because of the role it plays in the environment. It's a scavenger. Normally, you wouldn't find a scavenger very important. But scavengers are one of the most important creatures in the environment because of their niche, which is reducing pollution. Let's just say, if you remove the Indian flapshell turtle from its environment, all the snails and insects and the carrion would still be in the water. It would pollute the water. So the Indian, when you keep them in the environment, they eat the snails, insects, and carrion and reduce pollution. Now here are some local names which, pe which people may or may not be familiar with. I haven't heard them any time. So in Tamil, it is called Pal Amai. I don't know why. In Malayalam, it is called Velayama. While in Hindi, it's called Abhua and Matiya. Now I've finished the presentation. I'm just going, I have a lot of people to thank for this talk. I thank Dr. Cecil John for assigning me this talk and letting me take care of the turtles we found on campus. I thank Latif for supplying these wonderful photos. I thank my parents for supporting me. And I also thank the Indian flapshell turtle for no good reason. I have referenced the book by a acclaimed herpetologist, Indranil Das, A Naturalist Guide to Reptiles of India. It's a very good book. If you want to learn more about the Indian flapshell turtle, you should probably try looking this book up. Any questions? Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> Does anyone have any comments or questions for Neil? Oh, uh, Neil uh, Latif, your excellent talk. Thank you. That was fabulous to listen to. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing. I think uh, it, it probably Pal Ame. In Tamil, it's called Ame. I know. It's just the English translation. I mean, it's not, it's a bit hard to understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, if I remember right, we found three, right? We found three. We yes. found two near your house and then one was found near Sunset. Yeah, that is true, but that's not, those aren't the only flapshell turtles. There's also another one. There's this house on, I think, Ring Road, an intersection of Ring Road and South Road in the campus where there's a pond with an Indian flapshell turtle in it. Yeah. Um, so I think, if Latif, I remember right, we released them near that house. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. And uh, I, so pro the person there has some other turtles and uh, it's pro either it fell into that small pond or they moved it into the pond because the person in that house actually saw it and told us that he saw it at that night. Yeah, I think uh, the day we released it, the next day they told us that they had seen uh, the yeah. turtles there. Yeah. Yeah. But now they've kept it in their pond as sort of like a pet with the other red ear terrapin that they have. So I've actually gone over and looked at the turtle. So a me and a few friends of mine went over there to take a look at the turtle. So then an old, so one of the people who lived there came and asked us about the turtle. You know, they came and we actually asked them and they said they'd found it in the area and they just kept it there. So, but what's interesting is the turtle was the exact same size as one of the other turtles we released. So the smaller one. The one that flapped its arms around. Yeah. So, um, I probably about six months back, uh, I think Adarsh, my older son, and our maid, they saw a, tur a flap shell turtle in our backyard. Really? And oh, yeah. they, they, they put a bucket like thing over it, but when they got back to it, it had, it's, it's a very strong burrower. It burrowed out of that. Someone yeah. asked a someone asked a question about how do you where do you measure the length of the turtle? Ah, uh, yeah, it's basically you measure it when its neck is not being stretched. You measure it from the tip, basically from nose to tail, like how you would measure any other creature or turtle from from nose to tail. Yeah, so without it extending, it's. I just it's, wanted to ask: Do you do nose to tail for over the shell or under the under the body? Oh. I'd suggest doing it under the body because the shell is a bit dumb. These uh, flapshell turtles were really interesting. Um, when you pick them up, 
uh, I mean, they're initially quite shy and they can actually seal themselves up quite uh, well. And uh, I think the, it, the colors that we found were mostly gray, right? Not gray. They were the brownish green you were mentioned earlier. They were green. Yeah, brownish green, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but they were also but they were... Uh, full of, I uh, mean, they were covered with mud quite a bit because uh, they were burrowing when we saw them. Um, so I think the time when we kept them in a water tub, I think then we could see the, the uh, color. Okay. They've actually released that, you know, the egg yolk like fluid I mentioned earlier. Yeah. They released that in the tub. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Okay, and if there are no further questions or comments, shall we move on to the next talk? Thank you, Neil. That was very well done. You've given us a lot of information. And uh, as far as I, I mean, I've been on this campus a long time. Uh, it, it's it's this is quite a rare sighting. I don't think many people have seen these clap shell turtles, and so. We are not really sure where they come across the wall, did they come from the well? We're, we're not really sure of the source. Okay, Rajiv, over to you. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Hi, Rajiv. Yeah, we can hear you. So, yeah, actually I've logged it from uh, logged in from other uh, system. Okay. So hopefully we can get the weave here. So Yeah, I think we're good now. Uh, yeah, can you able to see the screen? Yeah, we yes. can see the screen, yes. Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm yes. not technically so good because... Uh, no, no problem. Yeah. All right. So, hi, this is Rajiv. I hope uh, everyone uh, knows about my picture, I guess, because I've been uh, posting every day in a nature group. So, that's the only place where I used to post pictures every day. And other than that, I hope uh, nobody have seen me before, I guess, but very less people will be knowing me, but that's okay, no issues. All right, uh, the given topic for the today is Owls of South India. So I have precise this uh, presentation, like I have took only the top seven owls from my side, so, so that I have kept this as a part one. So basically, if we talk about owls, um, basically, Everybody will be having a question like, you know, owls will be having, uh, you know, like the round eyes, they look uh, so scary and they bring a lot of superstitious to human life. And that's all the thoughts of human beings, but actually it's not. So nothing is in all species in nature. The Indian subcontinent is a home to 35 species of owls and actually 32 of them are recorded from India. Since we've been talking about uh, the owls from India. So I've been giving a small hints about Indian owls. But however, the entire world has 224 to 230 owls, which has been recorded so far. So black Eastern fish owl is one of the biggest owls, which is found in India, especially that's found in Canada and UK and also in US, I guess. So it can grow even two meters longer. So that is six feet. What do we know about owls? So basically, if you ask me a question, what is owls? So owls are actually the masters of nights. So they are the brutal nocturnal hunters. So this old owl or harbinger of deaths, and, but it's been hated by so many birds because you know, also feared by rodents and often loved by people. And also people will be having a superstitious thoughts. They, the lives of owls are secretive and mysterious. Spooky sounds in the forest, creepy creatures at night, and owls are the most mysterious birds of prey. They have the most powerful birds of prey. And also look at the owls, they'll be having a sharp talons, hook bills, and also the head that can swivel around in almost any direction. Owls can be lived in any part of the world, but except Antarctica. But Arctic oceans and around the places will be having only snowy owls, also called as a polar owls. So we'll be going into the uh, topic today. So I've got a table of contents. So first we'll be discussing about, not just first, also we'll be randomly discussing about the interesting fact so that might be a little shockful to you. And also the different types of owls. So as I've mentioned, we're gonna talk about only the seven owls in part one. 
So that is Indian scops owl and brown hawk owl are also called as a bubuk and Indian eagle owl, jungle owl, spotted owl and brown fish owl and oriental scops owl. And also the most powerful thing is take home message. And we'll be summarizing everything at the end. So here we go. The interesting fact. So the first fact is, as we said, owl can turn their heads almost in any direction, but actually it's not quite. The thing is, owl cannot able to rotate their head 360 degrees because the owls can turn from right towards back and left towards back, which is 135 degrees on either side. So which is almost 270 degrees. But however, according to the research and seeing like how owl can able to turn their head in any direction, but however, they are blood vessels with contractile, contractile reservoirs and they've got a supportive uh, vascular network all over the head and the neck. So that's why they are capable of moving their head all around. <clears throat> and also owl, owls do not have a spherical eyes. As we see that the owls will be having a ball shaped eyes. Owls are also have a binocular visions like humans, but however, owls will be having a tubular eyes, which means they will be having a cylindrical eye so which you see from the front and it goes all the way behind the skull and it will be fixed so that when you see an owl, you get to see this. If you see an owl, if the owl needs to see on the right side or the left side or wherever it may be, the owl has to see all around, like, you know, moving the entire head, like how we are just doing it. Uh, like, you know, we turn around only the eyes. We just move the eyes alone, just keeping the head front and we can see either side, right or left, but however, Owls cannot able to do that so because their eyes are fixed. <clears throat> so here owls have a superpower hearing ability and also owls are capable of uh, hearing their prey at any sort of situation. And deer mouse are one of the most interesting choice of foods in their menu. And uh, all flight is always silent. As you just look at the owls, owls are actually the majestic bird, but however, they got a soft, brilliant and it's a velvety plumage. So, which means whenever they are in the flight, they don't make any noise. So they break turbulence into the smaller current. So which reduces and muffles the sound. Owls swallow their entire prey. Usually like they don't eat in pieces, but once if they want to feed their kids or chicks, they'll break into pieces and they will give it according to their need. But once it become an adult, it'll swallow the entire food. And sometimes you will eat another owl, but it's thought to be a rare scenario. And also it'll be a little shocked for the Shock for the people who never heard this, but actually that's true. Owl feeds the strongest baby first before the other kids, because the other birds will grow up a little later, but they, the mother wanted to raise the first kid as soon as possible so that it will try to hunt by its own. And owls are the perfect, amazing, and uh, you know, the brilliant masters of camouflage, you would say. And here we go. The first owl comes in. So this is an Indian scops owl. So this is shot way back in 2009, 2020, I guess, if I'm not wrong. So Indian scops owl is one of the smallest owls when comparing to all other owl. But this is one of the largest owl in a scops family. But actually, it, uh, you know, it, it, it height ranges about some 20 to 25 centimeters. That's the max. And also, it has a small tuft on the head. And here you cannot able to see the tuft very clearly. They have the capability of hiding their tuft as well. And this is actually the species which is almost similar to called red uh, scops owl. So which is a migratory, but we don't get to see it in South India. But once a pallid scops owl has been spotted in Kerala, like long time back, but uh, there is no record in the past four years. The interesting fact about this owl is, and this is actually the one of the largest owl in the Scops family. And also the important thing is, which has been still under research. And the scientist is saying that Indian Scops owl has got uh, three different plumages, but still it's not yet, uh, uh, you know, confirmed by the researchers, but still you get to see a kind of little brownish and rufous, and also you get to see about some little gray as well. But uh, these colors are not prominent, but this can be seen. Could be the morph might be a little different, but uh, actually they look similar. And one more thing, the interesting fact about the, you know, the interesting fact about owls are owls have about some 14 vertebras in their neck. So the reason why they are actually, you know, the super easy for them to just move all around the head. 
So because they've got 14 vertebrae in the neck and, but birds, other birds and humans will have only seven. So extra vertebrae, vertebrae in the, in their neck gives the owls a wider range of motion so that they, they can able to move their head without, uh, you know, any trouble with ability. They can swivel around at 270 degrees. So next we get onto the habits. Um, the Indian corpse owl is a nocturnal bird that is rarely seen during a daytime. But however, they are perfectly camouflaged. If you get to see this picture, especially this picture. So when I saw this owl, seriously, I couldn't able to find the owl where it is because it's almost camouflaged along with the same color of the tree. And also this can be camouflaged mostly in the thickly foliage trees. And you can get to see in the, you know, the dead trees cavity. <clears throat> But however, this looks pretty smaller, but they can consume about some 600 to 800 mice in a year. Owls swallow their prey in a hole in one go. On the average, an owl can eat about some four to six small mice per day. And their breeding is not very well known, but still it's going on. And also um, the fact about owls are, owls usually do not uh, nest by their own. So owls will always prefer to take the abandoned nest by woodpeckers, or uh, by barbets, so something like that. So usually they are not a good builders and they don't usually build. So next we go on to the showstopper. So I hope uh, the people who's been in the um, nature watch group, they get to see a lot of pictures of this owl. And this is called as a brown hawk owl or also called as a brown boo book. And this has been in my wish list for a very long period of time. So I got this in a recent time. So, and I had a very great series with this owl. So if you just look at the eyes, you get to see, uh, you know, the striking colors in the eye. It looks uh, orangish. You know, you get to see um, there are three eyelids in the owls. So the upper eyelid closes down when it blinks. Meanwhile, the lower eyelid closes when the owl is sleeping. So usually the third eye eyelid is called as a nictitating membrane. So which actually protects from dust and also it keeps it moist. You get to see this nictitating membrane. Most of the eagles you get to see in, you know, any bird. So most of the 90% of the bird, um, you get to see this eyelid, which is called as a nictitating membrane. Next becomes the scientific, uh, the scientific name of this owl is Ninox scutellata. The brown hawk owl is also called as a brown boo book. So as we talk about the owl, owl eye color, so an owl eye color indicates that are hunting preferences. So you might be having a questions like, you know, spotted owlet will be having a, you know, yellowish color and uh, brown hawk will be having an orangish and some of the Colors meme looks like brown, completely brown. Some will be having uh, uh, so lime yellow. And owl's eye color indicates the hunting preferences, basically. So owls with a dark brown eye color preference to hunt at night. Meanwhile, owls with the orange eyes actively hunt during twilight. Yellow eyes are diurnal, and which means they hunt during the day. But only those, only there are two owls in the world, um, which is a northern pygmy owl, which can be found in Canada and US and other owl, I forgot the name. So these are the only two owls uh, which are non nocturnal. So they don't hunt during night. We can look at the picture of this owl. You can look at the eyes. Owls have the best vision, you know, comparing to any other animal on the earth. During night, owls have an excellent range of vision similar to that of an eagle. Their eyes also have a reflective surface behind their retinas called as um, taptum lucidum. So when you talk about the habits, so these are actually 90% these birds are completely, totally nocturnal bird. They, you might be get to see this birds during daytime, but however, um, their antique preferences will always during a dawn and dusk or maybe during a night. So this can be, uh, you know, uh, wrong with uh, pair or maybe with single. So you get to see sometimes a pair, but it's a, but it's a rare scenario. Yeah, so the first picture is the completely funniest picture. Like uh, the owl has been, you know, landed on, uh, landed on a different perch. So which actually it's not belong to owl's perch. So which means actually uh, keenly looking at the feather. So which is not belong to the owls. So this looks so funnier when I just shot this. The second, if you look at the second picture, you can clearly see that eyes and the details of feathers. It looks so great uh, during daytime. And also one of the interesting fact is, you know, throughout there is a film called as Owl Hedwig. 
the main owl that took a role which was train name called gizmo so which is much like any seasoned actor gizmo had a different uh, owl doubles if you get to have a time just watch this film called owl hedwig so there is a snowy owl which had played uh, such a vital role and also it uh, won so many awards for it but to be honest owls are not a good pets and also you cannot own one to be a pet Next, moving on to the next slide, when we talk about the breeding season, so breeding season basically between this May to July in North India, but however, it changes to every region. So if you talk about uh, the southern region, most of the time, the uh, breeding takes place during monsoon. The brown hawk is very vocal during uh, the breeding season, can sing almost continuously for an hour, especially on the moonlights. I had uh, twice, you know, like I had an experience of twice, like I went to an Amrithi forest to watch this during night time and uh, that you know it was that experience was amazing and it was thrilling because we get to listen to the vocals all the time because the entire night is completely fulfilled with uh, owl's call and the habitat and um, they actually found in forest well wooded areas also seen in the river banks and in so many places owls have asymmetrical ears means that owls are not located at the same spot on each side of their head and also not only are located in different positions, but the ears themselves have two different sizes. So if you talk about the ears, and there's a lot of people who mistaken that, and there are the two ear tuft on the head, but those are not ears. They are the tuft and nobody knows why it's there and what it is for. And also the ears will be located on just behind the skull. So it will be, the right one will be slightly behind uh, when comparing to the left. And one will be larger in size, one will be smaller in size. But however, they are most powerful in hearing. And next, next comes the monster. So the Indian eagle owl, this is one of my most favorite uh, owl. So this is so as large as uh, the eagle. So it can hunt uh, birds as big as peacock. They prefer rocky hills with the bushes. Also, this can be seen in many mango orchards and females are mostly larger than males. So look at the size of the eagle owl on the flight and you get to see. So most of the people, they say like, you know, the owls has got a very shorter legs, but actually it's not. Just look at the flight. So you get to see that, you know, how sharp is the talon and how strong the legs are. So they are most powerful, brutal hunters. So yeah, so this is the basic information which is being given. So yeah, and yet another superstitious thought people will be having is, you know, eagle owl is one of the specific owls which has been considered as a bad omen. So it is used um, in a sacrificial killing by tribals in search of good fortune. So the owls calling from people's uh, house is believed to bring uh, ill to the people of the house and also the people around them. So this is something so which we need to change it because still I've seen there are a lot of people who actually have their uh, bad thoughts, especially on this owl, because since it looks so majestic and gigantic, so people really don't like this owl because their calls are so scary. Once you get to hear this call and you'll be scared because humans are so weak during night. When, when you find a human during a, during a dark time, they are so weak. So that's why they are so afraid of their opals. And another interesting fact about the owls in general, the owls can also able to swim while they rarely do so because owls can swim through water. However, owls generally avoid swimming as a no means of defense in water because they have no issues in a, like uh, they're not gonna do anything with the water. However, the brown fish owl and uh, the tawny, um, tawny fish owl and the blackstone fish owl, they have, uh, they have to deal with the water because they need to get a fish for their food because fish is the number one list in their food. If you talk about the habits and this uh, owls are actually generally nocturnal and they actually uh, hunt from their perch, which means they'll sit on a branch and they look for uh, any any rodents and the rest of the things, and they'll go directly from the perch and uh, they'll take their food. So usually flies also uh, close to the ground, but it's a rare scenario, you get to see it. And this also usually feeds on insects, birds and small mammals and uh, rodents, reptiles. As I said, it can go uh, as big as like peacock also. <laughs> so I've shown you like, you know, the first picture, uh, in the next slide, which shows you like, you know, this has got a very strong and very long legs. Just look at the, the thighs and the talons and look at the beak, which is so sharp and take a look at that, uh, you know, eyes, they are so powerful. So if you get to see them closer, the first thing 
uh, you will get is you will get a goosebumps and also you'll be so scared so i always had a great chances of just uh, you know just having a look at this birds up close not all the owls can hoot but unlike uh, regular owls can be keep on hooting all the time another fact is barn owls do not hoot but instead they hiss all the time but uh, we are not included barn owl in this slide and we'll be talking about it this in next session i guess so generally these owls will be breeding from february to april but uh, the interesting fact about this so once they have find their place and uh, if they migrate for any other reason to a local other places so during monsoon they will be back to the same place especially they roost in a low dense forest with the rocky boulders so those are their preferable places to live so oh, yeah this is the thing and uh, the, another interesting fact about owls and people also have a uh, people also have a very great thought about owls is especially like during ancient times egyptians thought owls protected their spirits on the journey to under to the underworld while greeks used the owls to present ethna god as a wisdom but the romans mayans and uh, many other culture around the world see owl as something to fear symbol of bad luck which brings a bad luck to you and in reality owls are just a birds which have carved out a niche a unique way to live because because there is nothing superstitious in nature we need to admire everything and here we go the next thing comes jungle owlet if you get to see the eyes and this eyes are lemon yellow and also there is a white patch on the breast and also this is called as a bar jungle owlet you can see the bar are kind of stripes all over the body so this is also very smaller in size even this is smaller than spotted owl so these are the two images which has been shot uh, during a uh, mid noon so the powerful owl species in the low dense forest so this is the king of forest as ducks turns to dark and they looks down into the uh, forest clearing so that they go for hunting their eyes are turned for optimal night vision more importantly it listens so the interesting fact about owls is owls are actually the good listeners once you are being a good listener you can be able to uh, you know like uh, you can able to uh, do anything like whatever you've been targeting so it's always good to listen like owls a wise owl always will never speak more so which means it listens a lot but however after sal swallowing the whole prey the owl vomits out the indigestible um, you know the indigestible materials which remains as its kind of fur bone claws etc so in total owl's digestion process takes around 10 10 hours to complete so this owl usually um, you get to see them on the top of the trees and especially steep hill sites so this is not so common to see it everywhere and this is the two wonderful pictures i would like to share you here so owls feeds uh, their children actually owls are very good parents too so this is one of the luckiest picture that i get and uh, this is uh, this is the eye level shot so always we need to remember to think about this amazing species so which is actually which is around us we need to go out and explore all these beauties and especially the breeding season which takes from may to uh, march to may nest or in natural tree hollows or abandoned tree woodpeckers and barbed holes either in the trunk or branches of tree which standing in an open forest so here we go it comes with yeah so this is one of my most favorite owls too uh, this is our local hero so we get to see this in our campus you know, very easily this is called a spotted owlet i hope everybody would know this i've been already put up this write up in the weekly news couple of months back i guess so my heartfelt wish is that you know people should let go of this great superstitious thought about them the popular notion is that they are ominous and their cry is inauspicious that's their thought but however there is nothing inauspicious in nature because i've been repeatedly saying this just because we need to understand and realize that how important these are so yeah so instead of owl would take a nest left by a different bird to lay eggs but also the female during when they become a parent they take a scraps and debris and uh, other materials to make the nest sturdier and softer for their eggs and this is how they hoot and they can just give a variety of voices and screeches and chuckles but however owls are not actually pet birds and this is mainly due to their uh, nocturnal in nature which makes them less active during the day so most owls uh, are active during night only as i mentioned the other two owls which are um, not nocturnal the northern owl and uh, northern pygmy owl 
<clears throat> this also breached during the month of uh, May or uh, sorry, between February to April until May can happen. And actually it uh, differs from region to region. So especially if you talk about the, the Southern region, it usually happens between uh, um, like during the monsoon, most of the time, the temperature will be adaptable to them during monsoon. And uh, their habitat is mainly open or semi open country. And this is the largest number of population that we got here. And also you get to see them very easily. And also their calls are very unique. And also they can make three variety of calls. And next we talk about the brown fish owl. So these owls are one of the largest owls, even uh, this is almost similar like eagle owl. They occur in open wooded area, lowland forest and uh, plantations resides always near the water source where they always wanted to fish. Uh, you know, they wanted to do a fishing. So fishings are always a number one priority to them. And also fishes are the first part in their food list. And this owl always live near the river banks where they prey on uh, fishes as well as on small mammals and other birds. Basically sizes between like, you know, more than um, like 55 to 60 centimeters. And uh, females are always uh, larger than males. So this has been suitable for all the all species. They can often be seen in daylight, sometimes hunting, especially on uh, cloudy days. And also these are the owls and which is little difficult to see them at the eye level. They have always been, uh, you know, sitting on the top of the trees. Breeding is generally known from November to March. Especially, uh, they always wanted to do a, um, you know, breeding during their uh, winter season, mainly January and February, but late as, uh, you know, March or April in South India. So they will breed in abandoned stick nest of large birds or lock, uh, a rock ledge near water of cleft of a bank, river bank, or ruins of an old uh, building. So, yeah, so they can. Um, they can live in the ranges from low landscapes up to 1,800 meter elevation. So it's quite high. You get to see them um, in Nilagiris also. I've seen in Masnukudi once. And also you get to see them in Amadi Reserve Forest as well. And next we move on to the Oriental Scops Owl. So this is one of the smallest owls that which I've come across. And here you get to see that there's a more of a spotted and streak on the chest. So it's almost a mixture of the uh, Scops and uh, kind of a jungle, jungle owl. So the pattern is kind, kind of little mixed. So we got to see a three morph. One is a gray morph, one is a rufous, one is a brown. So the facial disc is pale, pale uh, with a narrow rim dark. So there is a whitish around the blackish gray bill. Eyes are yellow and eyebrows are white. The hind neck has indistinct rufous, black and white color. So this is a totally a nocturnal bird. And this is one of the, and this is one of the luckiest picture that I got it during a daytime. So I hope very less number of people have uh, spotted this during a daytime because this is a totally a nocturnal bird. You get to see them, you know, clearly during nighttime. And this size about less than twenty centimeters, which is even smaller than jungle owl, and also it is uh, too smaller when comparing to uh, Indian scops owl. So for the reference, which I took it from internet, and I will show you, this is a rufous moth. They got three morph, one is a gray, one is a rufous, one is a brown. So you get to have this a closer picture which shows you the proper details, the tuft, the beak, and the eyes and everything. And this is a such, uh, such a smaller bird so that it feeds mainly on the insects and spiders. They also take small vertebrates and hunting in done both from a perch and also in a flight. They are capable of, uh, you know, hunting from flight. And this also breeds from uh, February to May in Indian subcontinent. Habitat. And here comes the big part. So take home message is uh, owls are natural predators of rodents. So the most important thing is we need to make sure like, you know, uh, the rodents shouldn't be killed because the owls will take care of it. Owls also does the same work and also rat snake also will does the same work. Conserving owls will not only result in better rodent control, but also it results in a huge crop losses will do, uh, you know, which actually prevent indiscriminate chemical use that actually balances the ecological system in our nature. 
And these brown owls are actually the prolific brutal hunters, which means like, you know, they can um, hunt 10 to 12 owls, I mean, 10 to 12 rodents in the, in the night. So which means it can even take about some 800 to 1000 rodents in a year. That's quite high. So I've given a take home message, like what can be done to save them and avoid spraying the chemicals uh, in agriculture areas. Because there is a small scenario that I would like to share here. So once the farmer, he saw the rodent, which is, uh, you know, kept on troubling the paddy field. There is a lots of rodents, so which is there. So he was uh, scared, like it might destroy the paddy field so that he kept a poison for it. So the poison, which is ate by a rodent and the rodent, which was kept on moving here and there. And suddenly the owl saw the rodent. The owl actually goes and takes up the rodent. He eats it and the owl eats it because the rodent is almost dead because it took, it consumed the poison. So within, within few minutes, the owl also died. And the other day, the cat get to see the owl and it ate the uh, owl. So once it ate the owl and the cat also died, the owner of the cat, he saw that and he just throws away the cat. The thing is, once there is a, once there is a dead species and it has been taken by most of the uh, crows and also by the other uh, eagles so that here here the clear message is like you know you actually the farmer actually tried to kill only the uh, you know the rodent but the owl died the cat died the other birds also died so here the entire pyramid of the food chain has been broken down this is all because of humans as a humans we have to be very cautious in taking care of the other species too so that's why please make sure like we are not spraying any toxins on the ground and also we are not uh, um, you know we are not giving any poison to kill the rodents these days we get to see there's a lot of rat blues and uh, rat biscuits something like that please let's be more cautious to save nature and also we do not want to cut trees and abandon existing superstitious thoughts about owls thank you questions uh, thank you rajiv uh, open now for comments and questions. Rajiv, thanks. Uh, Latif here. Yeah, hi, Latif. Uh, uh, very interesting talk, and I learned a lot of new things about owls. Um, what you were talking about in the end towards uh, rodent control, I actually remember reading an article a while ago about yeah. how uh, I'll, I'll try and find the article and share. Uh, okay, but I sure. think in Assam, uh, they uh -huh. have actually made an initiative of uh, trying to get barn owls to roost in farmlands to control rodents. Uh, they started it as an experiment. Okay. Uh, so they were giving, like they were trying to get nesting sites for the barn owls. Okay. And uh, these barn owls in turn were helping by controlling rodents in the farms. Uh, that was an experiment that they were doing. I think they started in 2009 or something like that. I'll try and find the article and share in the group. Uh, sure, that was sure, very sure. interesting. Definitely. What you said just uh, links yeah. with uh, some article that I had read about that. Oh, yeah. Someone had their hand raised during the uh, talk. Did they want to? Did they want to ask a question? Uh, Rajiv, this is Sushil. Can you uh, tell us where you took most of these photographs? The eagle owl was shot somewhere in the hills around Bello. Yes, sir. Eagle owl. I've been shooting. Uh, you know, there is a place called. Uh, um, uh, I don't remember the name of the place. I, there is a small mountain which is behind the Tirtagiri. Tirtagiri. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We also get to see them in Tirtagiri. Yeah. But uh, during last monsoon, we had a great session of uh, yeah, photo photographing. Yeah, yeah, photographing because I get to see a pair. It was a very huge, you know, huge in size. But uh, we were unlucky; we couldn't find them one there. Um, the Sushil time. had said many times he's heard the uh, eagle owl. Um, uh, near the Blue Lagoon side in the night. Oh, and, okay. I, and I have seen one behind my in-laws house 
uh, in Oteri one night about two years ago. It was uh, it came and sat on the coconut tree behind their house. Okay, okay, wow. And I think Harsh has said, uh, or Justice has seen Eagle Owl in uh, on College Hill sometime. I think. Yes, yes, yes. I also you know got the message from somebody like saying they found some Eagle Owl. They saying they were not sure, but they said it's a kind of very huge like eagle like thing. So, where in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, uh, the eagle owl used to be seen. It was called, uh, had a different name then. It, it used to be seen on the College Hill quite frequently. It's seen on the Karigiri Hill uh, quite frequently in Karigiri area. I think, Latif, you've taken a picture near Karigiri, I think, on that. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So, I had, yeah, they have a little quarry like area. Uh, in, yeah, in I, I went there last week. I couldn't yeah. find one. I know oh, <laughs> there is one. I found one but like last year. Yeah, it's very that, difficult that to spot. The, it is but, very but that is one of the best habitat for them. Yes. That's an excellent place. The undisturbed uh, area. Like you said, the uh, spotted owlet is quite common on our campus. And yeah, we yes, see sir. them sometimes in groups of three and four also. I've, I've actually totally seen like, you know, there are two groups. One I, see, one I saw with uh, four in numbers and one with three in numbers. I get to see them in front of Dr. Uh, Vijanand House. Yeah, and uh, long back, uh, Harsh, I think, picked up one, a chick near... Uh, yeah, I also college, saw the picture. ...college canteen, and he managed to put it back on the, the roof of the shed, and it got reunited with the family. And uh, Anu and Winsley Rose, they also found a chick that fell out. Yeah, I they saw the picture. For a few days, and then they were able to get it back to the family. It was a very interesting okay. uh, thing to see. Because owls will always take a long time to adapt for the, you know, like adapt with other uh, species like humans also. Especially with humans, it will not get adapted because it's not a pet bird. So it's been abandoned all over the world. Anyone else any, has any comments or questions? I think uh, in on our campus we've also seen the barn owl, uh, and I uh, think yeah. Uh, yeah, so barn owl was, we saw once during day, and then uh, it has been spotted uh, around the campus a couple of times. Even Sushila said uh, he's seen barn owl in flight. Justice has seen barn owl in flight. I have seen it in flight. I have seen it in flight like a couple of weeks ago when we went for uh, Dr. Arichako's uh, farewell ceremony. Yeah, we went there uh, during night time. I just saw in a, in a like you know. Clear Ash. black background. I get to see them in a white patch. It was so nice to see them. Was that near the College Hill? No, sir. It's uh, yeah, yeah. It's near the College Hill. Yeah. Okay. I saw Eden when I was Garden. there in the Eden Garden. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. It was so interesting to see them. Yeah. So at least we have four, five species. We have scope owl. Scope owl. Indian scope owl is uh, heard regularly for us. Uh, but I think women's hostel has the uh, the the yeah some roosting affair. yeah no not roosting they were breeding no they oh, breeding uh, okay I think some students had uh, shared for photos I think two years ago uh, of chicks uh, in in the women's hostel so I think we have, have four uh, species in our campus itself uh, that uh, even see. even I have heard the calls uh, in recent times near CHTC when I was in Scudder School. Once a uh, barn owl got chased by crows in the daytime, and my uh, mother picked it up and brought it home, and we wow. uh, just put in a large cage which was on, uh, and we used to feed it mice. And after it got better, we were able to let it out. Okay, Neil has a question. Neil, go ahead. I've heard some stories about turtles, sorry, not turtles, <laughs> silly me, owl, spotted owlets nesting. In bed somewhere, I heard some stories of uh, of spotted owlets nesting somewhere, ne nesting in in literal houses. Does this happen? No, I have not heard that. We see them commonly around our houses in the evening, and some people get irritated because they can make quite a noise and cackle, um, and they get active in the evening time. But I've never heard of them roosting. Barn owls do roost in some people's large houses, old houses. That I'm aware of. I don't mean houses. I mean small rooms or apartments. 
It is that my mom said that happened to her when she was in college. So her roommate, there were little baby spotted owlets under her bed. I don't know if this is true or not. Okay. Um, it's beyond seven. Thank you both uh, Neil and Rajiv for your, both your talks were excellent. We've learned quite a bit. Um, I never knew that thing about the eyes that you talked about, Rajiv. That is totally new to me. Uh, and you're right. We have there is a lot of superstition, both about the turtles and the kind yes, and, yes. owls, and uh, they're considered bad omens. So when we used to keep owls and turtles, uh, our help at home never liked it. They thought it's not a good thing. Yeah. But I think slowly things are changing now. People are uh, coming more aware. Certainly, things have changed with regard to snakes on the campus. Uh, your Both uh, Neil's photographs from Latif and your photographs are really excellent, good quality, very interesting. Uh, some of the, like the one that you have now, with that one just peeping over the branch, uh, it's really interesting. So, uh, thank you so much. And I guess we're going to hear uh, part two sometime. Sure, sir, sure. Anyone else has any last comments or questions? Thank you, Sushil. If not, we'll close. I'd also like to thank the uh, telemedicine group who hosts this. It's a big help for, for us when they're able to do this. And they'll record it for us and they'll send it. And uh, I think Latif will post it on the nature group. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, right. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Latif. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Ramakya.